Welcome everyone to the Canadian Diabetes Association's 2016 webinar series. My name is Farah Ismail and I'm a program manager for CDA and I'll be your host for today. We're delighted that you are able to join us today for the webinar on Is Sugar to Blame? Now to start off, I would like to draw your attention to the survey. It's located at the top right-hand section of your screen. So in order to serve your needs better, we do kindly ask that you provide us with your input by completing the survey towards the end of the presentation, and we thank you in advance for your input. Now throughout the presentation, you will have the opportunity to type in the question and answer box, and that's located at the bottom right-hand section of your screen. We ask that you use this box for any questions you have along the way, and our presenter will be happy to respond to your questions at the end of the presentation. As well, we will be displaying a few polling questions throughout the presentation and would love for your participation. It is important to note that the responses will remain anonymous. Also note that you're able to customize your screen so you can expand and collapse them as you see fit, and this can be done simply by dragging down the bottom right-hand corner of each of the webinar pods. Our presentation today will last about 45 minutes and we'll have another 10 minutes at the end for questions. It is important to note that our webinar today will be recorded and made available on our diabetes.ca website. So now I'd like to welcome our speaker, Dr. John Stephen Piper, and thank him for joining us today. But before I turn it over to Dr. Stephen Piper, I'd like to give you a very brief introduction. Dr. John Stephen Piper is currently an Associate Professor in the Department of Nutritional Sciences, Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. He is also a staff physician in the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism and a scientist in the La Caching Knowledge Institute at St. Michael's Hospital. For more information on Dr. Stephen Piper, please read the entire bio section that's located on the left-hand section of your screen. So, without further ado, I'd like to present to you Dr. Stephen Piper. Thank you very much, Far, for that introduction, and uh, welcome to everyone, everybody, to the webinar. I'd like to start by thanking the Canadian Diabetes Association for this invitation. I'd also like to thank the Canadian Diabetes Association for funding aspects of the research that I'll be presenting to you uh, through their competitive uh, granting um, funding process, and to me personally as a clinician scientist. Um, I think uh, this is a particularly important issue, so I was very happy to see the CDA want to tackle uh, this particular issue, this issue of sugars, as sugars really have emerged as the most pub uh, important public health concern, um, certainly in the last 10 years, I would say. Um, and as evidence of that, uh, we know that certainly that the Canadian Diabetes Association has a position statement now to limit uh, free sugars. And the Canadian Diabetes Association has also had a call uh, for an excise tax on sugar-sweetened beverages. So I think that this particular talk is, is very appropriate. Um, now, and I want to support the CDA and, and applaud them certainly in, in their public health advocacy. Now, what I hope uh, to do with this very provocative title is, is Sugar to Blame uh, is to sort of outline for you some of the nuances and complexities um, in this story and hopefully help you to see the forest for the trees. Uh, what I'm going to say now at the beginning, and, and I'll say again at the end, is if you leave this webinar and this, this talk that I'm going to deliver thinking that sugars are somehow benign or that this is a defense of sugars, I don't think you've quite got the message. What I'd like you to appreciate is the, really the importance of context and what we're replacing sugars with that we always have to be very conscious of the food choices we're making and then really to see, as I said, the forest for the trees uh, in terms of this issue. Um, what I will just say as, as in starting too is that some of this presentation may seem data heavy. I know we probably have uh, a spectrum of, of experience and, and knowledge uh, in the area of, of uh, science, uh, but uh, I think it's still important to show the data because I want this to come across certainly as being evidence-based, not, not just my opinion. Uh, so I want you to be able to see the same sort of process that we go through when we do the Canadian Diabetes Association clinical practice guidelines, for example, uh, in evaluating evidence. Uh, so with that, I will start with my disclosures. I think it's very important to disclose uh, conflicts of interest. I've given my conflicts of interest here that are both academic, institutional, and intellectual, as well as financial. Uh, I think all are very important, so all are there for you to read. Uh, of note, um, I'm on the Canadian Diabetes Association Clinical Practice Guidelines for Nutrition Therapy. I was on them in 2013. I'm again on them in 2018. So a lot of this work uh, is informing that process, which I think is important. I'm also on European Guidelines and Canadian Cardiovascular Society Guidelines. 
the research that I'm going to show you that's from our group uh, was funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and through uh, some new funding uh, from them as well as the Canadian Diabetes Association and the PSI Foundation. But I certainly have uh, received, and I, I think this needs to be stated so we're clear on the conflicts of interest, unrestricted and investigator-initiated uh, funding from um, members of the food and beverage industry that might have an interest in sugars. So I just want that to be clear that that conflict is there. And I have received honorary and speaker fees from uh, many entities. My spouse also works for Unilever Canada, so I have a, uh, a conflict there, and I'm on the editorial board of a number of journals. So with that, let's start uh, the talk. And I thought we would start uh, first with a survey. So there'll be some polling questions throughout. So I'll just walk you through this, and I'll give you uh, about 15 seconds to answer. So how are you affected by di diabetes? Select all that apply from uh, type 1 diabetes through to other. So you have about 15 seconds to answer this. Again, your, your answers are anonymous, and this will just allow us to know who is there and, and help me in, in a way to tailor the message that I'm going to deliver uh, in this presentation. All right, so I'm hoping everyone has been able to uh, provide an answer. I'm going to move on to the next slide, and that will tell us uh, who we are. So how are you affected by diabetes? So it seems that uh, we have a wide spectrum of, of uh, individuals on this call based on their experience with uh, diabetes, um, both people that are living with diabetes and, and those that are um, actually actively involved in the management and care of people with diabetes, uh, healthcare professionals. That's wonderful to see. Uh, if we move on to the next question, um, I will ask you, have you participated in a webinar with the CDA before? So I'll give you about uh, 10 seconds to answer this. Um, please go ahead. And uh, we'll now see who we are. So it seems that at least half of us uh, have, and so I think that's useful in terms of the experience. Um, now if we move on to the presentation. So I think it's very important to provide a historical context. Uh, sugar is, is, is like so many stories in nutrition uh, that I think patients and health professionals and others complain about, where the story seems to always be changing. Uh, nutrition by nature tends to be quite cyclic uh, in terms of some things becoming in fashion and th some things going out of fashion, but the evidence does keep building all along. But it's, I think, important to understand the historical context. So how did we get here? Well, I think it bears mentioning that this uh, story is actually not a new story. So although it's sort of, uh, I think, emerged, as I said, as one of the most public, uh, important public health concerns in the last decade, uh, this is actually a debate that was occurring uh, over 40 years ago in the 1960s and 70s. And at that time, it actually was a very vigorous and active debate between fat versus sugar, between its two great champions. On one side, Ansel Keys, who graced the cover of Time magazine in 1961. And on the right of your screen, John Yudkin, who popularized his beliefs uh, regarding sugar in the book Pure, White, and Deadly. Now, I'm not going to go into the details um, of this debate because we know how it ended, and I think that's more the, the important issue here, is that the fat hypothesis related to chronic disease uh, emerged as the victor. It became the dominant hypothesis, and that shaped low-fat dietary advice going forward for the next 30 or 40 years, the vestiges of which we still live with in, in some of our dietary guidance. Um, and um, if we fast forward... Uh, from this period 40 years ago or more to present, we, we get the what I would call the second iteration of the debate, or version 2.0. And this started with yet another ecological study. So the studies that uh, were used to pit fat against sugar um, in the 1960s and 70s, what we call ecological studies, these are just uh, observational studies done at a population level uh, looking at an exposure and assessing an exposure to sugars or fat, for example, um, and its association with uh, disease outcome. In this case, it was the incidence of overweight and obesity with very limited ability to control or adjust for any confounders. So it's generally considered a very weak level of evidence and it's a hypothesis generating level of evidence, but people still uh, treat it as, as, uh, as, as important evidence and it's, it's quite seductive and has quite a history in nutrition. So this is no different here. So just over a decade ago, George Bray, who's one of the fathers of obesity research, a tremendous researcher and someone I have a tremendous respect for and esteem for, uh, published this ecological study showing that with the introduction of high fructose corn syrup in the uh, early 1970s, the increase that was experienced in high fructose corn syrup and the total fructose and free fructose mirrored the increase 
in overweight and obesity that was seen. Now, of course, as I say, this is generally weak level of evidence and there's no real ability to adjust for a lot of other things that happen. We know energy intake or calorie intake went up at the same time. Our occupational energy expenditure, the amount of energy we actually expended in the jobs we do and our leisure activities, those things went down. We became more car-centered, more suburbanized than our and where we lived. More, there was more screen time. There's a lot of other issues, but it still uh, struck, I think, a chord with, with a lot of people, this observation, and precipitated a, a really vigorous um, uh, research interest in this topic. Um, but it doesn't necessarily apply across all um, jurisdictions. So we looked at these data for Canada, for example, over the same period, looking at the availability of, of sugars and the intake of sugars using our Canadian uh, Community Health Survey and, and National Population Health Survey and Statistics Canada data. And what you see over the same time is actually sugars have gone down, whereas overweight and obesity have continued to go up. So this relationship isn't seen across all jurisdictions, and we term this the Canadian paradox, but there's also an Australian paradox and a UK paradox. Now what I want to say is I don't think that these data should be, or this evidence if you like, should be used to refute the data that was seen in the United States. I think it just means we have to be careful about, uh, I think, relying too much on uh, low quality evidence and trying to read too much into it. And one of the reasons is, is that ecological studies have given way to a term called ecological fallacy. Uh, and this is an example of one, and this is where what we see observa the observations we see at a population level may not actually apply to the individual. And this is actually the relationship between bottled water over the same time and overweight and obesity. And what you can see here is an even closer mirroring. Now, I don't think anyone would make an argument um, that bottled water is associated with overweight or obesity. Um, but this, so this is just to show you an example of why I think we have to be careful and just to show you this type of confounding that can occur. So why is it then that we are so quick uh, to believe this association? Where did this, um, you know, how is it that this association got such traction from these initial studies? Well, I'm not intending here to give you a biochemistry lesson, but I just want to show you, for those of you that have taken biochemistry, you'll be very familiar with this. This is the pathway by which we metabolize glucose and our, and our sugars. Um, and it's a pathway that you would find in any textbook of biochemistry. And what uh, the classical biochemistry teaching is, is that glucose, uh, glucose derived either from uh, sugar as part of sucrose or uh, from the digestion of starch or, or as pure sugar itself, is metabolized differently than is fructose. So it undergoes a series of rate limiting steps which fructose is able to avoid, um, uh, bypass. So fructose is able to bypass the main rate limiting step we say of this process and thereby act as what we think is an unregulated uh, substrate or unregulated precursor to feed into making of new fat and, and, and a lot of the downstream uh, things that we're concerned about. And this is really the underpinning which has, has led to such an interest um, in this topic and why I think the observational data has had such traction as it lends the biological plausibility um, to the story. Well, this um, really uh, perfect storm, if you like, has is, is, is culminated in an in, in incredible interest in sugars and, and sugars emerging, as I stated at the beginning, really as a, one of the most important public health concerns and what I would call a sugar-centric view of our chronic or our cardiometabolic disease, if we think of people living with diabetes and the diseases that affect them. And this here is just to give you an example of, of uh, how this has moved into the mainstream. So when I used to give this talk uh, maybe five years ago or so, if I was to show this slide, it would be really clippings from the scientific literature. It would be editorials and journals and commentaries and research pieces. But the media lag has passed, and I think everyone's aware of that, both patients uh, living with diabetes and the, the health care providers that provide care for the diabetes uh, and others that are certainly um, work with people with diabetes, uh, there, there's this real focus on sugars, and it's in our everything from our uh, popular uh, magazines, uh, news magazines such as Maclean's or National Geographic, but also in uh, some of the most important news framing um, uh, framers, such as the New York Times, and some of the most important financial papers like the London Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, as well as on popular media, and there's uh, also a number of, of, of documentaries and popular books. So this has absolutely hit the mainstream. Um, this has, uh, I think, uh, driven a, a number of uh, health authorities and guidelines committees to reevaluate their evidence uh, and their guidance as it relates to uh, sugars. And so we have an example of that uh, just in the last year. Uh, three authoritative uh, dietary guidelines um, groups um, issued guidance on sugars. The World Health Organization, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans Committee, which informs the USDA guidelines, 
and the, um, the SACIN committee in the United Kingdom all issued guidance. They all uh, recommended based on their review of the evidence that free sugars or added sugars, we could get into discussion what the difference is, but we'll treat them as the same for the time being, should be reduced to somewhere between less than 10% or 5%. Uh, now, what bears mentioning here is that uh, although the, these, these numbers look similar, is the evidence from which they're derived actually is very different for these three sets of guidelines, which I think speaks to some of the issues and the nuances in the data. So in the case of the WHO, the World Health Organization, the evidence uh, which is the basis for the 10% and the conditional recommendation of 5% is derived exclusively from dental caries. So uh, these data come from observational studies looking at dental caries in high consumers of, of free sugars versus lower consumers, and that's how they arrived at the 10% and 5%. The WHO also commissioned a review as it related to body weight, but did not find any dose thresholds for sugars that related to body weight. So those thresholds came exclusively from dental caries. In the case of the next two, dental caries also was part of, of the evidence that was reviewed, but the main evidence which, which informed the second one, which is the USDA um, guidelines, um, was uh, actually a dietary pattern modeling exercise. So in this case, they were looking at healthy dietary patterns, like a U.S. healthy dietary pattern or a vegetarian dietary pattern or a Mediterranean dietary pattern, and the ability to achieve those healthy dietary patterns uh, at different levels of sugars. And what they found is it was very difficult to achieve those healthy dietary patterns when sugars were greater than 10%. And then finally, the SACCON report, which is the last one, which set their um, threshold at 5%, Theirs was based on energy intake, looking at randomized controlled trials, comparing high sugar arms on those trials to lower sugar arms, and showing that in the high sugar arms there was a greater overall energy intake. So it had to do with energy intake and meeting the energy balance requirements of the population. So different evidence for those. Well, a number of, of local um, disease-specific associations and health authorities, certainly in Canada, have also, uh, because of, of, of the issuing of these guidelines, have also issued guidance. The first to do that last year was the WHO, who issued a, a, um, a guideline, or I should say a position statement, and their recommendation was that uh, really endorsed that of the WHO, that individuals' intake of free sugar should not exceed 10% of daily calories, and ideally should be less than 5%. What's interesting here is that the data from the WHO, again, was based on dental caries, but they did present some data as it related to cardiovascular disease as well that they believe that supported that position. And the, our own Canadian Diabetes Association issued uh, their uh, position statement um, last September um, with a very similar recommendation uh, that free sugars uh, should be reduced to less than 10% of energy. So this is the context, if you like, the background in which we uh, find ourselves when, with the, when faced with this question around sugars. And as someone that's involved in clinical practice guidelines and someone that's involved in direct patient care, um, what I have to ask is, uh, you know, when I look at these, these guidelines is what is the evidence? And to go back to our title, you know, is sugar to blame in, under all circumstances or is there some context that we need here? Can we actually select a healthy diet? based on one nutrient alone, based on fat alone, as we did for the last 40 years, or based on salt alone, or based on sugar alone? What are the contextual issues uh, when we look at the data that I can then bring to bear on my patients and that we can also uh, have a discussion of in terms of um, tailoring our clinical practice guidelines so that we can uh, really promote individualized nutrition therapy? Well, if we look at the evidence, we have to invoke an evidence-based framework. This is the same framework we use to inform our clinical practice guidelines for the Canadian Diabetes Association and others. And it's the, it really is the, the uh, a, a universal uh, system, uh, systems of evidence-based medicine that have accepted this model um, and, or hierarchy, if you like, of evidence, where the best evidence uh, designed, the best design trials that provide the highest level evidence come from randomized control trials that give us the best protection against bias as they allow for the randomization of those confounders, those things that might also influence the outcome to be equally distributed among a, a, a test group and a control group, so it gives us a good protection against bias and allows us to isolate the effect of, of the, um, the food or the nutrient of interest in the area of nutrition. Uh, and then the high level of evidence from observational studies coming from um, cohort studies. The rest of the studies don't really apply uh, when it comes to informing clinical practice guidelines and public health policy. So these are the highest level of evidence we use to inform clinical practice guidelines and public health policy. And in particular, we look to systematic reviews and meta-analyses of, of this high quality evidence because it looks at the totality of the evidence allows us to pool all of the evidence to come to an answer. Well, if we apply this hierarchy, 
what do we find? Well, let's start first with the observational studies and the best design of those, which is the cohort studies. Now, where these are different than ecological studies, which you won't find there and which have sort of driven a lot of uh, nutrition, um, uh, a lot of the tradition uh, fads that we've seen, where these are different is they, they tend to be uh, higher quality studies that are, are conducted with greater rigor, where we have better assessments of uh, or measurements of the exposures, in this case to sugars, uh, and good ascertainments of the outcome in case of, for example, diabetes or cardiovascular disease or stroke, patient important outcomes, and a long, long longitudinal follow-up to allow us to be able to assess those. So if we look at those studies, um, what do we find? Well, we've um, received uh, funding from the um, CIHR and the Canadian Diabetes Association to look at this question carefully, uh, among other sources. Uh, and I'm going to share some of that data with you. The, these are data from my research team. These are uh, um, data that were produced by some really excellent students. Uh, what I'll do is summarize first what we found. So when we actually model total sugars and look at total sugars in the diet, total sugars, total sucrose, total fructose, we don't see any association with uh, the different uh, diseases and disease outcomes that would be important to patients from overweight and obesity and weight gain through to heart disease. Um, the one exception is for gout, where we do see an association. So what I will show you is just an example, and we'll look at diabetes, because I think it's the most relevant to this webinar and discussion. So if we look at this, this was a systematic review of meta-analysis. Again, this is the high flow evidence where we, and the best tool we have for pooling the totality of the evidence from these high quality observation studies called cohort studies. Uh, my um, very bright student who's gone on to dietetic training, Christine Sillis, uh, did this work as part of a project. She screened over 7,000 articles to identify uh, 13 um, cohort comparisons, so these, these observational studies looking at total sugars in over 100,000 individuals, six looking at sucrose in almost 200,000 individuals, and six looking at fructose in over 100,000 individuals. And what did she find? Well, when she looked at total sugars, and this is what I was telling you when I was introducing uh, this area of research, she did not see any association between sugars and uh, diabetes risk or the incidence of diabetes. And the way you read this, you'll be, I'll be presenting a number of these. These are called forest plots. This is a way of, of, of presenting the totality of the evidence on a topic. So this is all of the available observation studies, cohort studies on this topic. And each little estimate um, represents a point estimate from those studies. And the diamond is the one we're interested in, represents the summary or pooled estimate from all the studies, the single answer, which is thought to be the best estimate or most precise estimate of the true association, in this case, between sugars and diabetes. If it's on the left, it's beneficial. So this is where sugars show benefit. On this side, sugars would show harm. And so what you see here when you look at the diamond is that there's neither harm nor benefit because the diamond crosses this middle line, which is unity which suggests that it's on the, there's a trend for actually benefit, but there's overall no uh, association. Well, what about when she looked at um, sucrose? Well, here it was quite interesting. We were very surprised. She actually found a protective association or benefit of, uh, of sucrose uh, for diabetes. Now, I don't want anyone to take the message away from this that more sucrose is better for diabetes. That's absolutely not the message. But this, I think, gives us confidence that there's uh, not harm associated with it when we look at the observation studies, these cohort studies. And now what about fructose? Well, when we look at fructose, we see again no association between the exposure to fructose and diabetes risk. And this is just to summarize again, we found the same thing from weight gain through to heart disease, the one exception being for gout, where we did see an association. So that was the one exception. Now, I think we have to ask the question because this has received the most focus and I think is the real proxy for free and added sugars. Well, what about sugar-sweetened beverages? What do we see there? Well, if we look at sugar-sweetened beverages, then we see the story emerge that we, I think, are reading in the newspapers and, and, re and watching on TV and through um, you know, um, different forms of social media and, and in the literature. This is where we see the association. So here we see a relatively consistent association between the exposure to sugar-sweetened beverages and diabetes through to stroke. So higher risk in these conditions uh, when we compare high consumers of sugar-sweetened beverage to lower um, consumers of sugar-sweetened beverages. So although we don't see it when we look at total sugars, total sucrose, total fructose, which are the sugars we actually consume in the diet from all sources, when we look at probably the most, the most important source of added and free sugar, sugar-sweetened beverages, we do see the association. But something needs to be said here, which is that I think there needs to be some context. This relationship only tends to be seen when you look at the highest versus the lowest level 
of intake. So it's really people that are over-consuming where they're probably providing excess calories that we see it. The associations that we see tend to be quite small, and that's true for everything in nutrition, things that even near and dear to my heart like glycemic index or nuts or dietary pulses, um, different dietary patterns. The associations tend to be quite small. This is not smoking or bike helmets or antibiotics. The associations are not as strong uh, as those, but there is an association, and it's certainly there. I don't want to diminish it. The other issue is that they, there's still this issue of confounding and the inability to really infer causation from these observational studies because what we know about high consumers of sugar-sweetened beverages is they tend to consume more calories, they smoke more, they exercise less, they have a poor dietary pattern, they have lower socioeconomic status, lower educational attainment, they have a lot of other risk factors for diabetes and a number of these conditions. And this, again, is not to pick on sugar-sweet beverages. That's true for almost everything in nutrition. So if we look at fish eaters, for example, where we see protective associations against these conditions, they actually exercise more and they smoke less and they have a healthy dietary pattern. So we, this is an issue that we, we, we are confronted with day in and day out when we look at observational studies, is this ability to disentangle these other confounders, these other lifestyle factors, which also contribute to disease, from what were uh, the, the exposure of interest, in this case, sugar-sweetened beverages. But again, I don't want you to leave this slide um, mistaking what's been shown here. There is an association that's certainly been shown for sugar-sweetened beverages from diabetes through to stroke. Now, what about other important food sources? So I think we have to ask the question, if we don't see the association for total sugars, but we do for sugar-sweetened beverages, well, what about other important food sources? The most important food source of free sugars and added sugars in the diet in Canada and the U.S. is certainly uh, non-alcoholic or sugar-sweetened beverages. But there are other important food sources that come from grain and grain-based products and grain-based desserts, from uh, fruit and fruit products, and from uh, dairy products like yogurt, for example, among others. What about these other sources? Do all these foods behave differently or the same? Is it added sugar really added sugar in, in terms of having adverse associations across all of these foods? Or is, there, is it a special case for sugar-sweetened beverages? Well, when we ask that question, we look at it, this is some work we did actually for our submission to the Canadian Diabetes Association and to the Canadian Institutes of Health Research for the funding that we did eventually receive from both of those associations to look at this question. Are all food sources the same? Are they, do they behave the same? So we put together all the totality of the evidence, all the existing systematic reviews and meta-analyses, again, that pool all of the available evidence from these same observations, these same cohorts, studies, the same ones that looked at sugar-sweetened beverages, the same ones that looked at total sugars, what do we find when we look at those same studies for other important food sources? What we found actually was quite interesting. So I'm just going to click the slide again uh, to help you sort of work through it. So in red, we see a, a, an increasing association. Green is actually protective, and those that aren't labeled, there was no association. So we do see this link with sugar-sweetened beverages that was discussed, where we see this increase in diabetes risk for sugar-sweetened beverages. We see an increase um, in risk for um, sugar-sweetened beverages which uh, uh, as fruit drinks, but we don't for fruit juice, although there has been analysis that have shown it, and we don't for things like sherbet, even cakes, pastries, and sweets, which we found interesting. And very interesting, there's actually protective associations for things like yogurt and ice cream and things like whole grain cereals. Now, I don't think we should be ra racing out to eat ice cream, but I don't, again, want to confuse the message and have people believe that ice cream this means that it's protective, but I think it gives us confidence that these may not be associated. And in particular with things like yogurt, where we may be trying to increase our intake of dairy products or whole grain cereals, where we're trying to increase our intake of whole grains and dietary fiber, things that we hear about certainly from our health professionals and are sort of uncontroversially considered healthy. The sugars in the, this context are actually associated with benefit, and it may be that the sugars help these actually get consumed and just make them a little bit more palatable. And if we look here, this is the same data I showed before for total sugars, just so you could see them all comparing them. So the special case here seems to be sugar-sweetened beverages. It seems to be the proxy here where we see this association and we don't for the others. Now, the question that comes from that is that we're confronted with, so why do sugar-sweetened beverages, which is the focus of the taxation policy, um, position statement of the Canadian Diabetes Association, why do sugar-sweetened beverages appear to be the special case? And I think this is an important question. It's more of an academic question, but I think it's still important to discuss. So one thing, and I, I don't have time to go through each one of these in great detail, but I'll just sort of give you the three main sort of 
cons- uh, hypotheses we have. One is that maybe because sugar-sweetened beverages, or uh, which is to say calories in the liquid form, may be more poorly compensated, may have elicit a poorer satiety response, allow for less compensation so that people don't actually modulate their intake and eat less. Uh, because they're in liquid format, this idea that liquid calories behave differently than solid calories. And we do have some evidence to support that, uh, but that, I think, remains an open question. The second one is that because sugar-sweetened beverages are easier to measure, so when we look at observational studies, you know, it's a very defined unit, especially single-serve portion sizes, is it because we measure it very well and we don't measure other sources of sugars very well and we don't measure total sugars very well because we have to derive those from all the sources because of uh, the issues around uh, mem- you know, remembering what one's consumed and, and reporting that um, accurately the, and with good fidelity. The last sort of question that's come up is, is it because sugar-sweetened beverages are a marker of a healthy lifestyle? And I, I, I raised that at the beginning when we deal with observational studies, I think we have to be careful because when we look at sugar-sweet beverages in particular, we see, again, the high consumers tend to exercise less, they smoke more, they have a poor dietary pattern. There's a number of other factors there. So I think all of these remain viable. But I think in the absence of seeing an association for total sugars or other food sources, I'm not convinced that it's the sugars alone. I think sugar-sweetened beverages are the special case. So if they are the special case and the main proxy for added and free sugars, how do sugar-sweet beverages compare with other risk factors? So of all the things that we need to worry about, how do they compare? And how do they compare in particular for things, uh, for example, like weight gain? Well, we do have some observational evidence that have looked at this. This comes from the Harvard cohorts. These are three Harvard cohorts. These are, again, large observational, longitudinal, prospective studies that look at uh, the exposure of certain foods and, and their relation to weight gain. Uh, in this particular study, they looked at an increase in serving of different foods every four years and the weight gain that resulted. And what you can see is that, yes, sugar-sweetened beverages, so just underline, there is an association. They're associated with about a one pound of weight gain every four years for an increase in one serving. But what I want to impress upon you is so, too, is processed meat, if you look over on the far right. So, too, is red meat, almost a pound each. And there is even more weight gain associated with, for example, French fries, over three pounds for an increase in one serving and over a pound and a half for potato chips. Now, I don't think we need to be having a webinar on potato chips or French fries or processed meat or red meat. What I want to illustrate here is I think we have to be conscious of the whole diet. And I think if we fixate on one thing, we cannot get distracted from those other elements and that these things tend to be collinear. They tend to go together. They cluster as a Western dietary pattern. And it's these things together uh, that likely represent the best solution in dealing with um, weight gain. So yes, sugar sweet beverages are associated with weight gain as, a, as an important source of free and added sugars, but so too are other um, factors in the diet, and we cannot forget those. And if it, one thing I want to leave you with this talk is that, yes, I think it's important uh, to focus on sugars as a, port, uh, as a source of excess calories. I don't want that point to be lost. But let's not forget all the other aspects of the diet. Uh, and what about when it comes to morbidity and mortality? I think the one that's most important to patients and most important to those that treat them is, you know, will, you know what about dying sooner? Uh, what about having more disease, greater burden of disease? Well, there was a nice analysis that was done in the Lancet, published in the Lancet back in 2012, that looked at 67 most important risk factors that are related to the burden of disease. And what you find is, is that sugar-sweetened beverages, first of all, was the only sugar-containing risk factor they looked at. So that's, so again, sugar-sweetened beverages coming out as a special case. But when you looked at sugar-sweetened beverages out of these 67 risk factors that they looked at, it actually uh, ranked only uh, 32nd out of the 43 that they did rank. And out of those that were related to food, it was 12th out of 15. And if I give you this graph here, this is for North America, uh, which I think is the best comparison. You can see here uh, the things that drive the greatest amounts of morbidity and mortality um, are what I think we come to think of. It's still tobacco and smoking that are the most important. It's high body mass index, being overweight, obese, high blood pressure, high fasting glucose, low physical activity, and a number of other nutritional factors which are quite important, fruits, vegetables, alcohol, sodium, all of these things play a role. And yes, sugar-sweetened beverages is there. I don't want to diminish its role, but it's uh, compared to the others, there's enough, quite a few others that would come ahead of it that I think we need to be concerned about. But certainly it is, it is still there. So I think it's very important to always put these things in context of all the things that we need to be worrying about and thinking about as we manage our diabetes and manage our, our, our risk, given that we have diabetes, for the complications of diabetes, 
you know, making sure that we maximize and optimize those things that are going to give us the best benefit. And sugar sweet beverages is there. It's certainly an important factor, but there are a number of other factors that we cannot forget. So what I would hope you take away from this slide is there are a number of factors. There's a, it's a multitude of factors which uh, certainly play a role. Now, what if we look at the highest level of evidence? And here we'll end the talk in, in sort of the last sort of uh, 15 minutes. The, the highest level of evidence coming from randomized controlled trials and non-randomized controlled trials that give us the best protection against bias. In this particular level of evidence, we don't have the sort of patient-important disease-specific outcomes like getting diabetes or heart disease or stroke. Most of these trials were done on risk factors like body weight gain or blood pressure or blood sugar or blood cholesterol. But they still inform this question and they give us a good protection against bias because they're designed. Well, when we look at the systematic reviews and meta-analyses of these studies that give us the best protection against bias, what do we find? Well, what we uh, asked first, and this was the, one of the first grants we got from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to look at this question is the question that came up first because it was really thought to be the main bad actor, the principal bad actor of sugar that was you know, driving this signal we were seeing for, for, for sugars was fructose. So is it all about the fructose? Is there something special about fructose in terms of its metabolic and endocrine signature responses, attributes, that lead to downstream consequences uh, that would be undesirable to us, like weight gain and increases in blood pressure, increases in blood sugar, increases in insulin resistance, fatty liver, and so on. Well, we uh, identified two types of studies that allowed us, I think importantly, to separate the effect of sugars per se from that of their calories. So we had substitution trials where they were simply swapping the fructose for another carbohydrate, usually with starch. So high, we had high glycemic index refined starch. And I think that was a good comparison because what we find is that uh, food producers, when they're making lower sugar products, they tend to backfill them with refined starch and maltodextrins to make up for the loss of the sugar to ensure the uh, ergonoleptic properties and the food processing properties of the foods. So the calories don't always change and they just replace it with starch. So is starch a better comparator? Is it better than, than, than fructose, for example, in terms of metabolic effects? And the second study design was addition trials where the fructose is added on top of a diet compared to the same diet without those calories from the fructose. So when you add extra calories from fructose, do you see anything? And I think that's very relevant to the way many people may consume uh, a source of added sugars where it is consumed on top of the diet, but it allows us to separate those two. Well, what did we find? I don't have time to go through all of the data. Um, what I will do is just summarize it. So we've published quite a few studies. These are the eight main studies that we published. And these, again, were done by really exceptional students that have gone on to advanced training, postdocs, uh, gone into medical school, residency programs, and, and, and uh, advanced training to PhD programs and beyond um, that had done this work from body weight through to fatty liver. And what I've done is I've created what I call a super plot to summarize it and you can read it the same way as the others. So if we look first at the substitution trials, this is just swapping fructose for starch. So is it better? You know, is it, if food manufacturers are replacing the sugar with starches, is that a better thing? And I think what you'll find is, and what we found is, when we look at more than 50 trials and more than 1,000 participants, again, this is the totality of the evidence from the trials over a large dose range, what we found actually was, was quite interesting. We found, and I just I put these green highlights so you can see it, that there was no effect on body weight through or no greater harm. So sugars did not behave worse than starch in body weight through to fatty liver. And in fact, in green here, fructose actually was protective for a reduction in hemoglobin A1C, and this was a clinically meaningful reduction. But again, I don't think that one should interpret this to mean that we should be consuming fructose to uh, help lower HbA1c, but I think it certainly gives us confidence that there's not harm. Uh, and there may be good reason for why we see this signal, but I mean, we're trying to address harm here. And we see is when you simply match calories, you match feed fructose for other source of carbohydrate, we don't see the increase in body weight, different lipid parameters that your doctor would measure, LDL, ApoB, non-HDL cholesterol triglycerides, HDL cholesterol tri postprandial triglycerides, blood sugar control, no more harm, fasting glucose, fasting insulin, insulin resistance markers, uh, blood pressure, we again saw this uh, protective um, effect, uh, uric acid or fatty liver. Now, what about when the fructose is added on top of the diet and providing excess calories, the so-called addition trials? Well, in this case, you see everything that we're talking about in the headlines. 
and everything that you've been exposed. So under these circumstances where the fructose is providing excess calories, then you do see the weight gain. You do see the perturbations in blood lipid risk factors and cholesterol, the increased uh, in blood glucose, the increase in insulin resistance, the increase in uric acid, which predisposes to gout, and the increase in fatty liver, both by direct measurement of the fat in the liver and uh, liver enzymes. So you do see it under those conditions. But I think that if we summarize, in the absence of seeing anything when you simply swap it, um, the, what we see there in the addition trials for excess calories is likely being driven, uh, the best explanation is by the excess calories. It's not that fructose has some special metabolic uh, or endocrine effects. Now, what about when we look at other fructose-containing sugars? So that was fructose. We don't consume pure fructose. We actually tend to consume fructose in the form of, of high fructose corn syrup or sucrose and some uh, free fructose. So what if we look at um, all sources of fructose-containing sugars and the way we would normally consume them? What do we find? Well, here we found four levels, uh, or if you like, four designs of trials which further allow us to isolate or separate the effect of the sugars from that of its calories. Again, separating the sugars and their effect in and of themselves from that of the calories that they deliver. We have the same substitution trials. These are trials where you're simply swapping the sugar for another um, source of calories, usually starch. The addition trials where the sugars are added on top of a diet, providing excess calories compared to the same diet without those. Subtraction trials where the sugar is actually taken away, so the calories from sugars are removed. You, the entry criteria for the studies and trials is that people are already consuming sugars and they're randomized to continue to consume those sugars and calories from those sugars or to reduce the calories from those sugars by displacing them with water or low-calorie sweeteners, for example. And then at libidum trials, which I think it gives us the best design for really the real world, this is the free replacement of sugars where people can freely replace as much or as little as they like of sugars for things like starch or fat. Then what do we find? Well, here... Um, when we look at the evidence, there's been a series of four systematic reviews and meta-analyses of four groups that have looked at this. And what's gratifying is how much consistency there is across the groups. We put our own data. So this is data from our group. There's data from the World Health Organization, data from Harvard, and data from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And what they find with good consistency is when you look at the substitution trials, again, swapping one for the other, find the same thing. This is the WHO Commission systematic review in our own that we don't see any further weight gain if the calories are matched, where there's excess calories are provided by the sugars compared to the same diet without those calories, then you consistently see an increase in weight gain, an increase that you would perfectly expect from consuming more calories. And in the subtraction trials, we remove the calories from those sugars. It's a bit of a mixed story, which is the case for so many diets where we have challenges in getting our patients to reduce calories, that it does work under some circumstances. So here it works in adults. This is the WHO Commission Systematic Review, but not in children. Looking at both children and adults, we don't see it here. And looking at children, this is the Harvard group, we don't see it. But what's interesting is in this one group, but I just want to highlight, when they looked at all comers, both adults and children and people with disease or without disease, when they restricted their analyses just to those that were overweight or obese or in a positive energy balance, and I think that's important because the majority of the population is overweight or obese, it is um, probably consuming more calories than you need, then, then you see um, that uh, there is a potential benefit. <clears throat> um, when, uh, and this is just to show you that, uh, that same story. So here the addition trials, there's an increase and there's potential benefit under some circumstances. Now what about the ad libitum trials? And this I think is the best design to look at the free replacement, the thing we do when we're actually free living and we make choices. Well, here it's interesting. The diamond we want to look at is the one down here. It appears under free exchange or ad libitum uh, exchange or conditions, the sugars don't behave any worse than other macronutrients that would replace it. But there were some differences, and so I just, in fairness to the data, I wanted to separate them so you could see them. When the comparator was high complex carbohydrate that actually had more fiber and protein, there may have been a benefit in reducing sugars with starch, so the free replacement of sugars with starch. But when it was fat, there wasn't. The trend was actually for a benefit of the sugars over the fat, although it wasn't significant. Overall, not significant. So I still think we, we're not quite sure there. We need some more data. Now, what about other endpoints? Well, uh, our group, thanks to the Canadian Diabetes Association, uh, Canadian Institute of Health Research, and the PSI Foundation, is beginning to look at the same question across different groups. What I'll show you here is the glycemic control data. This comes from a, a student of mine. She's just finishing her Master of Science, Vivian Chu. Uh, and what she looked at was glycemic control, which I think is directly related to this question of diabetes and very relevant and, and germane to this, this webinar. She screened over 3,000 papers. She found 98 substitution trials. 
This is an over uh, 1,500 people, 23 addition trials, and six ad libitum trials. So again, one, you're swapping one for the other, one, you're adding the calories on top, and one is the free replacement. And well, what did she find? That's a bit busy slide, but what we see here, I'll just summarize it is, we've, uh, she found the same thing, which is very gratifying that we see for body weight and we saw for fructose, that it's only when uh, the sugars provide excess calories that we actually see an increase um, in, uh, or in this case, of fasting insulin. So a, a, an insult, if you like, to glycemic control and increase in fasting insulin. There was actually a benefit again, which was quite interesting, suggesting there's likely not harm. I wouldn't take this to be benefit on glycated blood proteins when it was a swapping one for the other under isochloric conditions. Uh, but I think, again, this gives us confidence there wasn't harm. So it was only where the sugars provide excess calories. So this, this issue, again, is where the sugars provide excess calories that is the issue. Now, what about, in uh, just the last five minutes to finish up here, um, other risk factors? Well, we're looking at these, and we're finding the same story across these risk factors where under isochloric conditions we're not seeing any greater signal. It's where uh, what provides excess calories. But in, to be balanced, I wanted to show you data from the WHO Commission group that looked at this, not for the WHO, but did it on their own. They did a very nice analysis in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And in this particular case, they did see increases in triglycerides, total cholesterol, allele cholesterol, diastolic blood pressure. But just a few comments here, and I think want to you know, also reinforce why we need to continue with what we're doing to look at it. They grouped all the different study designs, the level of energy control together. So they analyzed everything together, isocaloric um, substitution, the addition, subtraction, and libidum. So it's very difficult, I think, to disentangle the effects of the sugars per se from that of the calories that they're deriving. And there were cases under ad libitum conditions where you, I think you'd expect to see um, the potential benefit of reducing sugars or harm for having too many uh, of actually there was no effect on total cholesterol or LDL cholesterol, no effect on, di on systolic blood pressure. There was actually a benefit here seen overall for HDL cholesterol. So I think still a, a mixed story and, and we need to clarify this. And I think in particular more studies and more analyses that I think are able to separate out the effect of the sugars from the calories is important in this discussion. So just a quick word as we finish here on unintended consequences. Uh, so given that, you know, in the absence of really seeing any effect of sugars when you match feed, you keep the calories equal for other sources of calories that would commonly replace sugars, in particular refined starches, you know, what are the consequences of this? What are the consequences of, of focusing exclusively on sugars and nothing else? Well, a concern I have is, is a revisiting of the low-fat paradigm. So industry responded uh, during the, the fat, fat years, if you like, by producing lots and lots of low-fat items, and they were marketed very heavily as being healthier. They certainly had a halo effect. People thought they were healthier. They selected them as they thought they were healthier. But the issue was in those products is to make them palatable and shelf-stable and all of the rest of it, the producers had to backfill and replace the fat with sugars and refined starches. The calories didn't actually change, but people believed they were healthier, continue to eat, overeat them, maybe consume more. We have evidence that if people think that something's healthy, they will eat more. And we didn't get any healthier or any better. And I'm afraid the same thing might happen here with, with lower sugar. So this is just to give you an example um, that's nicely set up here uh, looking at frosted flakes through to corn flakes. So corn fl uh, frosted flakes are just corn flakes with sugar on them. Uh, and what you might think is that a corn flakes is a healthier option because it has less sugar. It has very little sugar, in fact, um, less than three grams. But what you'll note is the calories are exactly the same. So if you eat this thinking it's healthier and you eat more, you'll be getting more calories and likely you're not going to derive any more benefit. And in particular, what's interesting is the glycemic index is higher of the corn flakes than it is of the frosted flakes, reduced sugar, and the regular frosted flakes. So you're potentially consuming a higher glycemic index food, which will impact your glycemic control. So this is sort of suggesting you can't rely on the sugar alone to select it. And to give a better example, one that I have right from my clinic, and I've had a couple patients where I've had this discussion with, where I'm trying to get them, I work in a lipid clinic um, and in people with uh, diabetes and, and various risk factors, and I'm trying to improve their cholesterol levels, and I'm trying to get them to eat more viscous, soluble fiber from oats, barley, and psyllium. When we look at products, let's say like Kellogg's All Brand Buds uh, with psyllium, I've had, pro I've had clients say, well, you know, they're, but they're high in sugar. They have eight grams of sugar, and so I eat special K or cornflakes because it has less than three or less than one gram. But what I tell them is, look, there's less calories in this product because it's displaced by, by, um, by fiber. And what's important here is this provides 13 grams of fiber per serving, whereas this only provides 
one gram or less. So really no fiber has a high glycemic index and a low glycemic index. So this idea that sugar alone can't be the only determination. So if I leave you with one message is that I think we need to have a broader discussion of foods and dietary patterns and rely on a discussion of that and understanding of that to really guide and determine most of our food choices. Sugar is important as a source of excess calories, but it's not everything. So what are the takeaway messages? Just to finish, well, I think it's difficult to separate the contribution of fructose-containing sugars from that of other factors in the epidemic of obesity and cardiometabolic disease and only the interaction with excess calories. Calories are very much inextricably linked here, and I think we can't forget that uh, when we're having this discussion. I think any threshold for the effect of sugars on our body weight or our risk factors is highly dependent on energy balance and nutrient adequacy. Um, so, you know, I think it depends on the, you know, the calories are a big determinant and, and whether you're getting nutrients or not. There are many pathways to overconsumption lead to weight gain, and I think we went over some of those. And I think dietary lifestyle patterns that embrace all of those, not just any one, uh, give the best opportunity for success. And finally, I want to say that targeting sugars, I think, and I want this to be very clear, is probably a, as a source of excess calorie remains a very prudent strategy and a very important strategy as sugary foods and beverages can be proximate pathway to overconsumption. So we definitely need to look at sugars as, a, as an important source of excess calories. But it doesn't mean that every source of sugars or every little bit of sugar, be it in a high fiber food or a high whole grain food or any yogurt, uh, is necessarily going to have the same harm as it is in something, let's say, for example, like a sugar sweetened beverage where it's not providing any nutrients. So the take home message is one cannot choose a healthy diet by sugars alone. So I want to restate here that like I said at the beginning, I don't want you to leave this webinar thinking sugars are benign. This no way is a defense of sugars. I just want you to appreciate the larger picture, to see the forest for the trees. It's about healthy eating, healthy diets. And that may, can include a bit of sugar and a bit of salt and a bit of fat. Um, and we can't select a healthy diet by those alone. We need to be looking beyond that. Uh, and we can't get distracted from the other important uh, risk factors that we have in our diet and lifestyle factors uh, when we focus too much on one. So we need to look at all factors. So with that, I just wanted to do another survey question. Um, can a healthy diet be controlled by sugar alone? So uh, what is your takeaway after I've having stressed my point that sugars, this is not to exonerate sugars or to say that they're benign. A healthy diet can be controlled by sugar alone. Yes, absolutely, or there is more to healthy eating than controlling our sugar intake. So sugar intake is important but there's more to eating, uh, healthy eating than just controlling our sugar intake. So I'll give you 15 seconds or so to answer that, and then we'll see um, what people thought as, they, as we struggled through the data together. All right, so I'm going to hit that now. Whoops. And it looks like uh, resounding there's more to healthy eating, and I think that that really is the take-home message. So I'm very pleased uh, to see that people grasp that. So what I want to say in relation to that, I think it's very important the work that the Canadian Diabetes Association is doing and the advocacy they're doing, um, both uh, in, uh, uh, in, in requesting and limiting excess um, calories from free sugars and their proposal to, uh, for an excise tax. I think all of this work is important, but I think there needs to be a healthy discussion and context around it. <clears throat> So those are my acknowledgements. Those are the main sponsors of the work that you saw, so I want to thank them uh, for their work. And this is to thank my group uh, for all of their contributions. I couldn't have done it without their contributions. And uh, we'll leave it now to questions. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Stephen Piper. You've definitely shared with us some very important information on sugars and how they behave in our body. Um, so thanks again for taking the time out of your day to speak to us. Um, we do, um, we will take a few questions, folks. I know just to respect everyone's time, we just have a few minutes left. Um, so we do appreciate all the um, wonderful questions that have come in. Um, for the ones that we don't get to, please feel free to email us at webinars at diabetes.ca, um, and we'll do our best to, to get responses to you as soon as possible. Um, with that being said, I'll start off with our first question. Um, our first participant has asked, is coconut sugar okay for someone with um, controlled type 2 diabetes? Um, so I think coconut sugar should be regarded as sugar. Um, I mean, there's some suggestion they have a lower glycemic index. I'm not convinced by the testing that was done to show that. And I mean, even if it is a lower glycemic index, sugar is sugar. Um, I mean, fructose is a very low glycemic index. That doesn't mean that we should be consuming more of it. So I think, yes, it's safe in moderation, and you follow the, the guidelines and position statements of the, as, as they've been issued, and I think it's, it's a perfectly safe sugar as sugars go, but it's still sugar. It still can represent an important source of excess calories. 
Great. Thank you so much for that response. Um, one of our par other participants has asked, why does my sugar rise with sucralose but not with aspartame? Um, that's an interesting uh, question. I mean, I, that, those sugars, those sorry, low-calorie sweeteners have been looked at carefully in controlled trials. Uh, nothing that I showed you here today, but what I can say to you is under those circumstances where I've seen the trial evidence, uh, we don't see that actually you get a greater rise after sucralose than aspartame. They both behave the same in that you don't get any rise in blood sugars. So um, what might be happening in the case of this patient is really an idiosyncratic response where it's something that they're consuming it with. Maybe it's the food that it's consumed in and the format, the, pl the matrix, the food matrix that's uh, causing that increase in, maybe it's the starches, for example, that are, is causing the greater increase in one over the other. But the evidence that we have for those two low-calorie sweeteners is neither one elicits uh, a glycemic response. Okay, great. Thank you for that response. Um, we'll move on to our next question. One of our other participants has asked, based on the people that you come into contact with on a regular basis in terms of your clients and patients, could you advise me on perhaps a website or even an app that might help me um, track foods um, that have nutrition values attached to them? Okay, terrific question. I, I get this a lot. I mean, and one we even use with our medical students is there's the um, Dietitians of Canada has an e-tracker, um, which is free. You register for it. You can put in your foods. You can see, um, you can play around and see the profiles, the calories. Um, so I, w I would certainly um, take a look at that particular site. And then a great resource, obviously, for people with diabetes, and I'm a little bit biased here because of my affection for the Canadian Diabetes Association but it, and our work on the guidelines, but is the Canadian Diabetes Association. Um, the guidelines are online for professionals, but there's also a lot of, of patient tools and, and knowledge translation tools there that help to make those guidelines translatable to, to patients. So I would certainly advise the uh, diabetes.ca website. Great. Thanks so much. Um, and unfortunately, folks, we'll take our last question now. But again, please email us at webinars at diabetes.ca to get responses to your other questions. Um, so, Dr. Stephen Piper, uh, what's better, raw or brown sugar? <laughs> I, I think it's this, this question goes back to the question on coconut sugar. I think uh, we need to get a – I think we sugar is sugar. I think that needs to be understood. Um, you know, sugar from whatever source you get it from is sugar. Now, that's to say from a health standpoint, uh, and I think it has to be counted as an important source of excess calories, but also a wonderful way to make healthier foods palatable. Um, and I think um, what needs to be, you know, understood here is – that it comes down to values and preferences. So whatever you prefer uh, in your, you know, culinary preparation of foods that gives the greatest palatability, I mean, I think those are the stronger arguments for using different sugars. It's not that any one is healthier than the other. I think sugar needs to be regarded as sugar. Okay, great. Well, that concludes our webinar for today. I'd sincerely like to thank Dr. Stephen Piper for speaking on behalf of the Canadian Diabetes Association. It's been absolutely a great learning experience. Um, I just want to send a reminder out to everyone that our webinars will be available on our website at uh, diabetes.ca in the coming weeks. Um, so if there's anything else that you want to uh, participate in in terms of our past webinars or if you'd like to hear this one again, um, it will be available on our website. Um, also note our upcoming webinars. So this is uh, our first webinar for the series. So we have another four coming up March 2nd, 8th, 15th, and 23rd. Um, so please visit our diabetes.ca website to uh, register and participate in those. Um, Dr. John Stephen Piper will also be profiled in our research brief in our spring 2016 issue of our Diabetes Dialogue, um, and that will be uh, available in early March. So please uh, visit our diabetes.ca slash dialogue to subscribe for your copy today. For any other questions um, or anything else relating to diabetes, please call our 1-800 number. So that's 1-800-BANTING, 226-8464. Uh, Thanks again for participating in today's webinar, and we hope you had a great time.